chapter twenty four of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a laprofox recording all laprofox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit laprofox dot org recording by kathleen the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty four the five dots with a cry of delight janet flung herself into her husband's arms and the two clung to each other for a few seconds in the inarticulate joy of reunion then she drew gabriel into the house shutting the door behind him and gazed earnestly into his face her first thought was that they had lied to her when they told her that sin and shame had written their story upon his features there was not a word of truth in such a statement he looked older perhaps but his face was more spiritual and saintly than ever the face of a man who like enoch had walked with god her next thought was how much better in health he looked than when they parted he had lost all signs of delicacy and appeared strong and well and in good condition then all thoughts were swallowed up in the ecstasy of seeing him face to face and feeling his dear arms round her once more it was only now that the misery of it was suddenly relaxed that janet realized all the agony she had undergone since gabriel's disappearance it was only in the revulsion back to joy that she knew how terrible the bygone pain had been for a time her whole being was merged in the torrent of overwhelming happiness which swept over her soul wherever gabriel had been he was now at home again whatever he had done he was still her husband bound to her by an indissoluble tie which could never be broken for what seemed an eternity of bliss the two married lovers remained locked in each other's arms murmuring meanwhile passionate and inarticulate expressions of tenderness and endearment the first to speak was janet oh my love my love she whispered it is heaven on earth to have you back again my dearest think what it must be to me to come back dear heart where have you been this long time janet went on when her husband allowed her once more to speak life has been dark and hard indeed without you gabriel's eyes filled with tears as he looked into her face and saw the lines that sorrow had engraved therein my poor little girl what a brute you must think i have been janet started back and put her hand over his mouth no no gabriel i have never thought you that although god knows it has been hard to hear he also knows that i have never once doubted you nor imagined for a moment that you were in any way to blame my confidence in you is as firm and unshaken as it ever was see my beloved i will prove it to you by never again asking you any questions as to your absence as long as you tell me that you have been well and happy i am content my own darling wife it isn't that i don't wonder where you have been and why you didn't come back to me before continued janet i have done nothing but wonder that all the time but if for any reason you would rather not tell me don't remember nothing that you say or leave unsaid will ever make any difference in my love to you gabriel's only answer was another passionate embrace and then janet said come into the drawing-room love and see baby and i will get you something to eat even gabriel well as he thought he knew her was astonished at her absolute trust and confidence was there another woman in england he wondered who in such circumstances would not have insisted upon knowing where her husband had been and what he had been doing and why he had forsaken her he had not found so great faith as this in all his life before and when she laid their baby in his arms it was just the same she gave up the child absolutely into his keeping without asking why he had left her house unto her desolate until that child was born but my dear love you must hear why i went away and why i could not come back before he said after he had kissed and blessed the boy not unless you wish to tell me she repeated it is enough for me that the dead is alive again and the lost is found and once more he marvelled at the perfection of her faith and love but after he had had food and drink and was refreshed and strengthened he told janet his story and she sat at his feet in the firelight and tasted the full fruition of human bliss after i left you that day in the inn he began i walked for a time over the moor and then the fog suddenly 
became so dense that i missed my way altogether and when i tried to get back again i found that i had completely lost all my bearings once or twice i found myself at the edge of deep pits or quarries and was only just saved from falling over so after one or two experiences of this kind i decided that it was unwise to wander about any more in the fog and that i had better find some sheltered spot and stay there until the mist lifted janet shuddered how terrible she murmured gabriel continued then suddenly i found myself close to a shepherd's hut and thought i would wait there until it was safe to go back to the inn again it was not yet dark as it was still early in the afternoon but the wall of white mist was impenetrable so i entered the hut and to my horror found that it was already tenanted and tenanted by an escaped convict from dartmoor prison i knew him at once by his dress oh gabriel whatever did you do i did the best i could in the circumstances i told him at once who i was and that i had lost my way and i begged him of his courtesy to allow me to share the hut with him was he very wicked-looking janet asked no that is the strange part of the story he was an exact counterpart of myself in appearance the same age the same height the same colouring the same features he might have been my twin brother i have since found out that he was a noted criminal of italian extraction by name caesar costello and that he was serving a five years sentence for a burglary near exeter more than a year of which sentence was yet to run how very strange that he should have been so like you exclaimed janet those accidental resemblances are always strange my darling but perhaps this one may be to some extent accounted for by the fact that both costello and i have italian blood in our veins and in the two cases the same mixed nationalities have produced the same physical type yes yes now i begin to see how it all happened gabriel continued his narrative but the worst part is yet to come to my further horror i found that the man was raving mad at least so he appeared to be at the time but i have since discovered that he feigned madness in order to suit his own purposes and was really as sane as you or i and a great deal cleverer what did he do he was silent at first evidently maturing his plans and seeing how he could make the most of the opportunity thus thrown in his way and then suddenly he seized a rifle which he had with him he had seized it i presume from the warder in charge of the gang when he knocked the ladder down and escaped and held it at my head saying that he would shoot me if i would not grant a request he was about to make and what was his request asked janet absorbed in the story that he might tattoo me on the shoulder it seemed a mad idea at the time just the thing for a maniac to think of but i have since seen how ingenious it was so you submitted there was nothing else to be done it seemed certainly preferable to be tattooed than to be shot and it never occurred to me at the time that the man was anything but the dangerous lunatic he pretended to be so i thought it my wisest plan to humour him certainly you were entirely at his mercy since he was armed and you were not and janet shuddered again at the thought of her husband's imminent peril so he unloaded his rifle took the gunpowder out of one of the cartridges and with the aid of the finest blade in my own pocket-knife which he borrowed for this occasion tattooed my shoulder with five small dots in the shape of a cross did it hurt janet was always very woman only like five pin-pricks it was done in a few seconds he just pricked the skin and rubbed the gunpowder in then he laid down his weapon and became most affable showing me a similar tattoo mark on his own shoulder and i fool that i was congratulated myself upon having humoured his insane fancy so successfully by that time it was really getting dark and as soon as the darkness came on the man picked a quarrel with me evidently in accordance with his rapidly devised plan what did he quarrel about dearest i really cannot remember gabriel replied it was all so sudden before i knew where i was he was wrestling with me and we were fighting for dear life and after that i remember no more until i came to myself many weeks afterward in the prison infirmary 
after a severe attack of brain fever and found that i had unconsciously taken the place of the escaped convict janet seized her husband's hand and covered it with kisses then did you tell them who you were and explain everything she asked of course i did but nobody believed me they had found me lying unconscious at the bottom of a stone pit close to the shepherd's hut and i wore the convict's outward appearance and was dressed in convict's clothes moreover if further proof were needed of my identity with him he was distinguished by a tattoo mark upon his shoulder five dots in the shape of a cross and there on my shoulder was the same self mark which by the time that i was well enough to require confirmation as to who i was had lost every sign of being recently done and looked as if it had been there for years how could they doubt that i was he oh gabriel they ought to have known better gabriel smiled the old sweet smile that janet knew so well i do not really see that they were so much to blame all the evidence was on their side and naturally they regarded my statement either as the delirium of illness or the feeble subterfuge of a recaptured prisoner besides my very hands testified against me for as you know i have so roughened and coarsened them by working with the lads in my parish at carpentering and gardening and the rest and by conducting the gymnasium for the benefit of the boys that no one could take them for the hands of a gentleman they looked as if the picking of oakum had been their wonted occupation then evidently the man escaped in your clothes because you were supposed to have ridden to newton abbot in a farmer's cart and to have taken the train to london said janet was i then evidently the man who went to newton abbot was costello wearing my clothes he must have knocked me senseless and while i was unconscious have changed clothes with me then apparently he dragged me out of the hut and threw me over the edge of a neighbouring stone pit not caring whether i was alive or dead and then he escaped to london it was evidently he whom the gay thorns saw in paris and then janet related to gabriel the parisian incident those are his clothes that you are wearing now i presume she added the clothes that he wore when he was first taken into custody gabriel looked down at himself with disgust yes the prison authorities gave them to me this morning when i left off my convict dress are they not too terrible for words costello certainly got the best of the bargain in the way of clothes and he laughed softly and you you served out the rest of his sentence i served out the rest of his sentence my dearest and god was with me all the time thus the year which the locust had eaten was returned to janet and her husband came back to her alive and well although or perhaps because she was prepared to forgive everything there was nothing for her to forgive for it is the things which we cannot do that we are called upon to do in this life not the things which we can how often we notice that sickness is sent to those who lay unnecessary stress upon the advantage of bodily health and poverty to those who set undue store upon the possession of riches while such as exaggerate the happiness of human companionship are doomed to a solitary life and such as crave inordinately for fame and distinction are condemned to ineffective obscurity just as in the old days it was the cowardly schemer the man who always made up in craft what he lacked in courage that was compelled to wrestle upon mount peniel until the breaking of the day while it was the very hebrew of the hebrews the man who breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the lord and brought them bound to jerusalem that was called to be the great apostle of the gentiles thus men and women are taught how to compass the impossible and to endure the unendurable since all things are possible through christ which strengtheneth them there was great interest felt and expressed not only in his immediate circle but all over england in gabriel carr's return his experience was so remarkable that it was commanded universal attention of course there was sincere regret expressed in high and official quarters over what had happened and an elaborate apology was dispatched from the home office but official apologies however handsome and well clothed they may be 
hardly compensate to an innocent man for the discomforts arising from false imprisonment the mistakes of those in authority are hard to correct the state can do no wrong and therefore when it does it is no easy matter to put affairs right again but all things work together for good to gabriel carr according to the promise as he had preached and as he had believed so it was done unto him the regular hours of plain fare and the absence of all responsibility in his prison life had done more for his overwrought nervous system than any so-called rest cures could have done and gabriel was once more a strong man like janet he had learnt to cast all his cares upon one who cared for him and so he likewise had possessed his soul in patience and had waited for the lord but although he was restored to health and strength the rector of gaythorn did not resign his country living and once more take upon himself the responsibility of a town parish he gave all his spare time of which he had plenty to revival work and conducted most successful missions all over england which were crowned with abundant results for he felt that in this way he accomplished more work and gained a wider spiritual influence than he would ever have done in one parish however large and populous so the lord turned the captivity of gabriel as the streams in the south and blessed his latter end more than his beginning and he accomplished that which he pleased and prospered in the thing whereto he was sent for god was with him end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty five caesar costello it was about a year after gabriel's return and he was conducting a mission in one of the largest seaport towns in the north of england as usual he set aside a portion of each morning and evening for seeing privately any who might wish to consult him upon spiritual matters and giving them discreet and ghostly counsel and great was his amazement late one night when who should be ushered into his sanctum but the quondam convict caesar costello once again gabriel was startled by the man's extraordinary resemblance to himself and yet hardly to himself as he was but rather to himself as he might have been had he chosen evil instead of good and walked in the broad path that leadeth to destruction rather than in the narrow way the end whereof is everlasting life there but for the grace of god stood gabriel carr gabriel carr as he would have been had not the master called him to be his disciple and had he not heard the master's voice and followed him whithersoever he went and as gabriel looked closer he saw with the trained eye of the priest which is quick to pierce below the surface and read the hidden things of the heart that costello was not the same as when he saw him that day in the shepherd's hut upon dartmoor continued sin and vice and dissipation had ploughed fresh furrows and inscribed new lines upon the man's face but there was something more than that out of the mud wherein the sinner was wallowing a pierced hand had made clay and had anointed his eyelids and whereas he had been blind now he saw saw himself as god saw him and regarded his sin as god regarded it and the sight had well nigh driven him mad in broken accents costello told gabriel his story told how he had been living in paris upon ill-gotten gains ever since his escape from prison draining the cup of illicit pleasure to the dregs and how he was then on his way to america there to seek fresh woods and pastures new where he might pluck the fruits of sin and cultivate the flowers of vice on his way to the docks he had passed the door of the hall where the rector of gaythorn was conducting his mission and having learnt from the notices outside the doors 
who the missioner was costello was compelled by curiosity to look in just to see once more the man who had stood in his place and had suffered in his stead and then through the mouth of the preacher god spoke to the sinner and called him out of the darkness of ignorance into the marvellous light of spiritual knowledge in that light costello saw the hideousness of his own soul and his own sins and cried to the mountains to cover him and the earth to swallow him so that he might escape from the presence of the living god the fear of the lord consumed him the fire of god's wrath shrivelled him up horror overwhelmed him and terror made him afraid his soul stood naked and ashamed before its maker and strove in vain to hide itself from the vengeance of god and now he came to the man who had been god's instrument in awakening him out of the sleep of sin to the awful consciousness of his own condition in the hope that he might thereby find balm in gilead and a physician to minister to his spirit's sickness for long hours gabriel talked and prayed with the stricken man on the sinner's behalf he wrestled until the breaking of the day with one who is ever mighty to save and because the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much because he himself had vicariously suffered and had implicitly believed he had power with god and prevailed and then there happened to caesar costello that great miracle which is as old and as new as the great miracles of birth and death that miracle which is described by catholics as regeneration and by evangelicals as conversion and by the master himself as being born of the spirit that miracle which is as mysterious as the wind blowing where it listeth and though men hear the sound thereof they cannot tell whence it cometh nor whither it goeth and yet without which no man can see god as the two knelt together wrestling with god for a sinner's salvation their prayers were heard and answered the son of man who alone hath power on earth to forgive sins blotted out the handwriting which was against the ex-convict nailing it to his own cross and a clean heart was granted to caesar costello a right spirit was renewed within him he was converted and became as a little child and then and there entered into the kingdom of heaven after the men had risen from their knees costello's first thought was how he could make reparation for the sins he had committed and he told gabriel that he intended as soon as it was day to give himself up to the authorities so that they might send him back to dartmoor there to work out the rest of his sentence but gabriel bade him forbear i do not know if what i am going to say to you is according to the laws of man he said but i believe it is according to the laws of god and i tell you not to give yourself up again to the authorities nor to return to prison costello was amazed this had seemed the only course open to him but he was ready to subjugate his will and submit his judgment to the man who had shown him the way to the foot of the cross i will do whatever you bid me he replied then listen i hold that one sin cannot be doubly expiated nor punished twice over and your sin has been expiated your chastisement has been borne by me therefore i believe that the punishment of your iniquity is accomplished and your sin is pardoned because i have suffered in your stead by right of what i have borne for you i have redeemed you and now you are no longer your own but mine tears filled the criminal's eyes and he could not speak he was dumbfoundered by such generosity i dare say i am all wrong according to the laws of england gabriel continued with a smile but i believe that i am doing right according to the laws of heaven besides surely i have paid the full price for what i claim i served fourteen months in dartmoor for it and that was no light matter but mayn't you get into trouble yourself by screening me for the first time in his life costello put another's interest before his own 
oughtn't you to give me up to justice no my conscience is quite clear on that score what i have heard from you has been told under the seal of the confessional and therefore i am bound not to repeat a word of it it would be against every principle of my sacred profession and calling all i could do would be to induce a penitent to give himself up to justice if i thought that was the right thing to do but in this case i do not think so then do you mean to say sir that i am to go scot-free and not to be punished any more costello could hardly believe his own ears i do i believe you are not to be punished any more in this world because i have borne the punishment for you just as i believe you are not to be punished in the world to come because christ has borne your punishment for you twice over have you been redeemed first by god and then by man and if god remits punishment because another suffered in your stead ought not man to do the same shall man be more just than god costello broke down and sobbed aloud sir your generosity is almost more than i can bear when i think of all you have endured for me and how i have treated you i feel i am unfit to live gabriel laid his hand upon the other's shoulder ah now we are coming to the point of the whole matter if you feel like this when you think of what i have done for you how do you feel when you think of what my master has done for you for your sake i spent fourteen months in dartmoor prison for your sake he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross i endured imprisonment that you might be free he suffered death that you might live i changed places with you involuntarily and was punished in your stead of his own free will he took your sin upon his shoulders and bore the full chastisement of it so that by his stripes you might be healed i became your surety because i could not help myself he took your nature upon him and bore away the guilt of your sin because he loved you and gave himself for you therefore if you are grateful to me what must you be to him a thousand times more so for the first time in my life i begin to realize what christ has done for me and it is you who have made me understand this by what you have done for me by the love of the brother whom you have seen you are learning something of the love of the god whom you have not seen said gabriel it is by no means a new method of gaining divine knowledge and do you mean to say sir that you can forgive me for all that i have made you suffer at my hands i have not suffered for you a thousandth part of what my master has suffered for you and as he forgives you so i forgive i can never thank you sir never so it is no use trying to do so and do you mean to say that i am free to go where i will and do what i like certainly not replied gabriel with his old whimsical smile i never said anything of the sort you are no longer your own you are bought with a price twice over you have been redeemed and now you belong first to christ and then to me the criminal fell on his knees before the priest and seizing his hand kissed it i will be your servant to my life's end he cried whatever you tell me to do i will do it this is what i tell you to do and though i speak of myself i believe that i also have the spirit of god you shall go to america as you had arranged and in the berth you have already taken and when you land you shall go straight to a missionary training college the head of which is a friend of mine to whom i will give you a letter of introduction and there you shall learn to serve christ in the mission fields and i swear that i will serve him so help me god you cannot stay in england you see continued gabriel if you do the police will track you and send you back to prison and i cannot help believing that you can serve god better by carrying his gospel to the far-off isles of the southern seas than by picking oakum in dartmoor jail 
besides he added with a humorous twinkle in his eye we have defrauded the government of nothing in that line i have picked your full share of oakum so the authorities can have nothing to complain of though i have no doubt they would complain a good deal if they only knew sir i will follow your counsel to the end of my life you shall never regret what you have done for me this night gabriel's face grew serious again i shall not know how you requite my dealings with you but christ will know how you requite his i shall probably never see you again but his eye will be with you even unto the end of the world upon you and you alone will rest the awful responsibility if you neglect so great a salvation and now we must get to business and conclude all the arrangements he added changing his tone the day is breaking and there is no time to be lost as your ship sails for america in a few hours from now and i do not want you to miss it and to fall once more into the hands of the police i would rather let you fall into the hands of god than into the hands of man and into his hands i commit you body soul and spirit from this time forth and even for evermore with his usual efficiency and rapidity gabriel gave the future missionary full instructions as to the new life on which he was about to enter and the way in which he was to set about it and wrote a letter to the head of the training college giving such instructions and advice regarding the convict as he thought necessary and then he put before costello food and drink and finally dispatched him with a blessing to serve god according to his day and generation so caesar costello went on his way rejoicing because the former things had fled away for ever and all things had been made new knowing that he had passed from death unto life because through the medium of the love of a brother he had learnt something of the love of god End of chapter twenty five epilogue of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thorny croft fowler epilogue three years had come and gone since the events narrated in the last chapter in a house in prince's garden a man and a woman were sitting over their dessert i can just finish this cigarette and then i must get back to the house my sweet the man said the woman rose from her seat at the head of the table and came round to her husband's side perching herself on the arm of his chair it's a funny thing she said with a sigh a very funny thing but you were right and i was wrong after all he laughed he knew how very remarkable it always seemed to her to find herself in the wrong as how he asked putting his arm round her oh about politics and things i thought you'd smash up the party and ruin the country when you got into the cabinet but you've done neither the one nor the other again the man laughed it is amazing how little permanent mischief even the most gifted and indefatigable of politicians are able to accomplish the mistakes of the greatest statesmen are not nearly so irremediable as they would fain believe the great forces of nature and the permanent staff pursue the even tenor of their way regardless of changing governments or fluctuating parties and nothing really makes much difference nothing really ever does make much difference to anybody replied the woman except dying and getting married but i believe that everything did said the man when i was young and unofficial in fact in those far-off times there was precious little that i did not believe i used to think you much too high-flown an ideal you know so i was when revelling in the unsubstantial pageants of private membership or irresponsible office but then the cabinet like an angel came and whipped the offending adam out of me in my unofficial and unregenerate days i aimed at the stars 
and a very good thing too paul it is the people who aim at the stars that succeed in sweeping their own chimneys and the people who set out to ascend the jungfrau that manage to get to the top of notting hill now stupid sensible people like myself and wrexham for instance only aim at the chimneys and so do nothing better than ring the front door-bell we set out for notting hill and get no further than the albert memorial which things are an allegory it is quite true as a distinguished statesman once remarked that politics is the science of the second best i suppose when you come to that most things in this world are the man's arm tightened round her except one he said and the reality of that exceeds the wildest dreams of the maddest idealist his wife nestled up to him you are a very successful man paul and have had a good many cups of happiness put to your lips the cup of success and the cup of fame and the cup of power and the cup of rank and in fact quite a trayful of them which do you like best of all there is no comparison my darling he answered with a laugh of absolute content of all the cups of happiness that have been put to my lips i have found none to compare with the falsely so-called weaker vessel and so with your permission i will just put my lips to it again and he kissed her with all the rapture of a lover the scene changes on the lawn in front of an old-fashioned manor-house a man and two women were having tea a small girl of two years old was trotting about from one to the other while a baby boy lay asleep in a perambulator i consider that it is almost time for lisa to have a thimble of her own remarked the elder of the women when i was two and a half years of age i could sew quite neatly and at three i joined the village dorcas meeting by jove mother but you were an extra forward one exclaimed the man who was lying full length on the grass at his wife's feet his teacup in a position of imminent danger at his elbow you can't expect the poor little kitty to be as clever as her grandmother that charles is what i do expect the training of a child cannot begin too early when i was four i read the fairchild family aloud to my dear mother and at five i was conversant with all the information contained in near home and far off lisa's mother smiled languidly if you gave her a thimble now she would probably swallow it and i've always understood that thimbles are most indigestible but the old lady shook her head i never swallowed anything at that age nor did my sister maria a shout of laughter emanated from the figure on the grass his sense of humour had ever been elemental great scott mother you must have been wonderful children do you mean to tell me that you and aunt maria never had anything to eat or drink charles do not be ribald what i mean is that my sister maria and i never swallowed anything that was not intended for swallowing we were too well trained well it strikes me that you swallowed a good deal one way or another if you were dosed with near home and far off to say nothing of the fair child family eh mother charles i cannot permit you to be irreverent it is an atrocious habit for the young and i beg you will not allow yourself to fall into it the man did not reply to his mother but he looked up into his wife's dark eyes and smiled and she smiled back stroking his yellow hair as she did so as they were both still on the sunny side of thirty it struck them as distinctly funny to be referred to as the young ten years later they would have accepted as a compliment what they now treated as a joke but that is the rule of life the sarcasms of to-day are the compliments of to-morrow and yesterday's sneers are to-day's plaudits so we learn as we grow older to be thankful for small mercies as to the volumes you mention continued the elder lady quite unconscious of the fact that she was affording much amusement to her juniors i derive from them immense benefit in fact all my present knowledge of 
tibet i owe to the reading of far off or asia described so i can believe murmured her daughter-in-law but fortunately nobody heard her at this moment the youthful lisa made a gallant attempt to sit down upon her father's teacup and was only saved from doing so by the prompt action of that parent himself but her grandmother went on undisturbed as soon as she is old enough to understand it i shall read portions of the fair child family aloud to lisa as i know no book more fitted to open the eyes of a child to good sound protestant doctrine by jove it does that exclaimed her son who had been himself brought up on the work in question and gives you the shiver sometimes into the bargain if you can make her as good a woman as you are said the younger woman i shall be thankful for you to read to her anything that you choose thank you fabia and if she is as good a daughter to you as you have been a daughter-in-law to me you will have indeed cause for thankfulness and i shall probably find my old copies of near home and far off and read those to her as well as i do not approve of modern books of travel they give young people such erroneous ideas i read one only yesterday which said that the south pole was actually colder than the north pole and that is obviously absurd as the north must in the course of nature be always colder than the south i consider that these modern habits of proving that black is white and hot is cold and north is south are extremely unsettling to the young and frequently lead to atheism once more the scene changes in a large church in the east end of london the newly appointed bishop of shoreditch was preaching to a vast congregation he held them spellbound for he was one of the most striking preachers of his day a man who had already risen to high office in his church and who was destined and fitted to rise still higher a man who had been as a beacon set on a hill to countless struggling christians and who being endowed with wisdom from on high had succeeded in bringing many to righteousness in one of the foremost pews in the church two women and a little boy were sitting drinking in every word of the preacher's discourse and filled with pride and exultation because of him for to them he had been respectively the most dutiful of sons the most devoted of husbands the most loving of fathers and now they rejoiced that at last he was entering into the fruits of his labours at least the two women rejoiced the boy was as yet too young to understand anything save that all these hundreds of people were listening to his father and that he ought to be proud indeed of being the son of so great a preacher as for the preacher himself the lord had brought him out of prison that he might praise his name also the lord had given him twice as much as he had before he had gone through much tribulation but his faith in god had never faltered and now he saw the end of the lord that the lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy he forgot his misery and remembered it only as waters that pass away for at last the lines had fallen to him in pleasant places and he had a goodly heritage for the third and last time the scene changes upon the shores of an island in the southern seas three men one white and two black were walking up and down engaged in earnest conversation the white man was a newly ordained missionary who had but recently come to these parts but who had already made his mark there by the untiring zeal and unflagging enthusiasm which he displayed in his master's service the blacks were two native priests whose sacerdotal pride and love of power were up in arms against the new faith which was gradually sapping their influence for evil and supplanting their religion of hate and cruelty by the worship of the god of love 
the bishop of that district had come on a visit to this particular island in response to an invitation from the chief of the savage tribe which dwelt there a man considerably in advance of his race and people who was anxious to learn and to embrace the doctrines of christianity the young anglican had rowed the bishop over from the missionary station and was now waiting his boat securely stranded on the beach while the bishop and the chief held private converse together in the hut of the latter some few hundred yards away it was the opportunity of the native priests and they took it they were well aware that the man before them was one of the most ardent and untiring of all the hated band of missionaries and they believed that if he were once out of the way his weaker and less impressive brethren would soon follow and that thus their island would once more be left secure in the fetters of its former heathenism of the bishop they did not take much account he was growing old and his sphere of work was so wide that he could visit each particular island but rarely but this man was in the prime of life not much over thirty and was distinguished by considerable personal beauty moreover his labours were confined to this particular corner of his master's vineyard and he was seen frequently in this island preaching the gospel which the native priests hated and promulgating the religion which they regarded with dread at first the two natives approached him in a friendly and commercial spirit walking up and down the shore with him arm in arm and endeavouring by means of costly presents to bribe him to go away and trouble them no more but to their surprise he refused and would have none of their skins and furs and feathers then they became angry and threatened him told him that unless he would give his word as a white man that word which could never be broken that he would not visit their island again nor attempt further to convert its chief to christianity they would kill him then and there and still he smiled his serene smile and bade them hear in their own tongue some of the wonderful works of god and then as they looked steadfastly on him they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel and the devils that were in them were filled with that hatred which the sons of darkness ever feel towards the children of light the hatred which persecuted job and stoned stephen and crucified the christ so the two savages fell upon the european and slew him then and there and then fled into the dense forest to hide themselves until the wrath of their chieftain on finding that his people had murdered one of his beloved missionaries should be overpassed when the visitation of the bishop was ended and he returned to his boat he found the young missionary lying dead upon the shore pierced through with many arrows for the life which was twice redeemed first by the master himself and then by the master's servant had been freely and willingly given up to god the end end of epilogue end of the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thorny croft fowler